computer. There we go. All right, cool. I think it's working. Excellent. Okay, now we're recording. So, October session of Community Hangout uh, is officially in process. Right, go ahead. So, for people who haven't heard about it before, the Incremental Improvements Project is our attempt to highlight tickets that don't require a lot of pre-existing knowledge about the platform that are appropriate for new people who are just getting started working on open edX, be they either new employees at edX, AppSembler, you know, OpenCraft, other companies in the uh, community, or even just like, college students, recent CS graduates who want to start working on a new an open source Python project. And there's an OAP describing the process for creating those tickets and what the workflow for getting them done looks like. Um, the primary focus on the first batch of tickets is on getting edX platform updated to work on Python 3, but we are starting to create some also for front-end development with little accessibility fixes, and for developers whose primary platform is Windows, making sure that DevStack actually works on that platform. It does mostly right now, but there are a couple of little issues we need to resolve, which seem to be small enough that a new person who just knows Windows development could probably help us get that sorted out pretty quickly. So we actually recommend that people getting started on open edX development start with one of these tickets because it helps nicely separate the process of learning how to contribute to open edX from the process of fully understanding the architecture of open edX and figuring out the details of implementing a major new feature. Uh, if so, we'd like people to start working on these and if there's any places where the documentation's not up to snuff or if there's a problem with the process or if you spot some room for improvement, we'd love to hear about it. And where do they go to find out yes. exactly what the web's about? I mean, what the Inker is about? Yeah, so on the uh, Open edX uh, proposal site, there's the, um, the actual OAP for incremental improvements. There's also a blog post on the Open edX blog explaining the background of this and how it works. And it has links to the OAP and also to the JIRA project for incremental improvements. And then there's multiple epics within the JIRA project for each of these sub uh, projects that I mentioned earlier. I think you've taken in some pull requests already? Or? Yeah, we already have at least, I believe seven um, of these tickets have been finished and merged. Um, there's already a couple dozen more in there and we can take them to hundreds more, once there's more traction on it. So you know, please get these finished so we can get more written and get all the stuff done. Awesome, all right, thank you. All right, sliding over. Um, next up is conference updates. So as I mentioned, there are lots of things to uh, announce here. We officially launched the uh, website, which you can find at uh, conf uh, con openedx.org. <laughs> Thank you. Um, we officially launched. We, uh, we are taking registrations now. Uh, we are looking at the conference as an entire four-day thing, as opposed to just two days bookended by two separate events. And so the first day, uh, the first official day is the uh, tutorials day, and then the last day is the developer summit day, which if you've been making any kind of pull requests at all, we will send you an invite to attend for free. Um, otherwise, it's a $99 uh, day long event with, uh, with lunch included. Um, but I'm anticipating most people there being uh, those that have already made contributions, so probably doesn't apply to you. Um, in any case, that's the, so that was launched. We launched the call for papers. Uh, I do anticipate a lot of people in this crowd uh, uh, provide, uh, supplying your proposals, filling out the form. Um, we're, looking to, we're looking to take a number of topics. We'll have anywhere from four to six uh, uh, concurrent um, tracks, but we'd like to consider a number of topics from teaching collaboration to working with Open edX to launching an Open edX based program uh, to pedagogy and course design uh, to you know developing and extending Open edX. So we'll want to mix and match uh, uh, technical as well as um, pedagogical uh, type of content and research uh, uh, research content. So please uh, fill out your um, fill out the form and get us a proposal. Uh, we, we look forward to last year we had 130 so we're looking to exceed that and see what we get. Um, any questions about the conference or anything else coming up? One thing to note is the short window on the CFPs. So Ned says there's a short window in the CFPs. I think we have it open until November 21st. The Wednesday before Thanksgiving. 
right. So before you, uh, right. So before, before the, when, before the, uh, the day before American Thanksgiving, uh, just in case there are any non, uh, non uh, U.S. <laughs> residents here, um, the day before is the, the deadline for the CFP. So we're happy to bounce ideas off of you. If you, if you want to create a Slack channel where we can discuss just things related to the conference, we can create one. Um, just let us know what you want to do. Uh, we'll, we'll do whatever you guys want. All right, any questions about the conference? Any other reminders from Ned? Uh, all right. Uh, was anyone on this call at the architecture hangout? I think it was what two weeks ago, something like that. Peter was. No, Peter was. Just, Peter, do you want to uh, give us like kind of your your thoughts on how the architecture hangout went? Sorry to put you on the spot, Peter. Uh, can you hear me now? I can hear you now, loud and clear. Okay, great. The hardest part was getting the mute off. Uh, I, uh, I think it was a, uh, a great start. Um, and I think I gave Misha or in general this feedback already, but uh, it, it was really encouraging to have, you know, like a, a high level view of uh, the architecture and the, the plan going forward. I think, um, I, I'm eager to start getting into the details, um, either from the perspective of what's, what work is being done or um, particular aspects of um, uh, the architecture. But it was nice to have the, uh, the diagram and the plan. So it's a good start. OK. And just so you know, we, so we plan to have these every month. And we're looking to. Uh, build on these topics that we discuss here in the uh, so we can create the content for the developer summit and have the discussions there so we want the topics discussed at the architecture hangouts to be you know the fodder for what we discuss when we get to the developer summit so any new OEPs any any other changes that you want to see in the platform any things that anything that you guys want to propose um, should be discussed in the architecture hangout uh, as we go forward, that's going to be kind of the that and the architecture Slack channel are going to be kind of where we talk about you know architectural changes um, going forward. So that's going to be a, a big part of you know our, our monthly routine. We've got this hangout, which is kind of like everything, kind of a very high level view of everything going in the community. We've got the architecture hangout, which is a very uh, in depth, uh, developer focused, um, you know, monthly uh, kind of office hours kind of thing. And then we have uh, what's called the configuration hangout, which uh, every month we really want to talk about things specific to those uh, deploying OpenEdX, maybe at scale, uh, maybe in production, but things specific to a, a DevOps uh, lens or focus for uh, OpenEdX. Um, so whatever uh, you want to, however you feel about those uh, three hangouts, give us your feedback. I'd like to hear more about things that you'd like to present. Um, and uh, hopefully we can get the more of those going. I'm looking to, if you guys want, we can create more working groups around specific topics. Um, that's also a possibility depending on how much interest there is. So keep that in mind and, and uh, be sure and let me know. All right. Um, so I am happy to say that we have a guest uh, talking about uh, the mobile update, uh, as well as maybe some things around Ironwood. I don't know. But uh, Marco, you want to take the helm? Oh, sure. All right. I was originally going to try and join on this computer and share a screen and all that, but uh, I think I'm going to just actually read go to this. A, you want me to go to the, this? We don't have to. You can, if it's easy. But I'm going to say. Um, so I'm not sure if actually we've given a mobile update. It's possible that AJ has had the chance in the last six months. No, not really. Uh, no. Okay. So this might, this is maybe the first time for a lot of folks that we're covering this topic. Uh, so I will do kind of a very quick overview of sort of where the mobile team and the application sort of currently stand. Um, and for some of you, this may be a recap, um, but hopefully it's quick. So um, when we started the, the mobile app in, I believe, 2015, hopefully I'm not misquoting that, that would be embarrassing. Um, 
The original version of the app was called the edX Video Locker, and that meant that it was basically a way for you to store, download, and view videos. Um, um, so the second major version of the app, what we call 2.0, is what we're currently in. And the major shift moving to 2.0, which happened about two years ago, was um, the inclusion of both the HTML and problem content, as well as video. So it's much more than a video locker. We've since, I think, removed every vestigial part of the video locker code um, sort of over time. Uh, so the application as it stands today includes um, the full course, so the course outline, it also have, has native support for discussion forums, a very basic learner profile, as well as access to your course certificates, if you have any. Um, there are other sort of supplemental views into the course handouts, announcements, um, and there's another sort of dedicated area for you to view just videos instead of viewing the whole course structure all at once. So what, what we're working on right now is adding support for programs on mobile. Um, and what that's going to do in version 2.16, which is live for iOS and being prepared right now for Android, is uh, it'll show both the course tab, the program tab, and then discovery. Um, so that's the basic sort of high-level layoff for the mobile applications, um, probably sort of gutting a bunch of things or cutting a bunch of things in corners. but. Um, to talk about what we want to do next or where we're going, uh, I would point you to this single statement, which is sort of our kind of team mission statement or sort of goal here, um, which is that through our mobile applications, OpenEdX delivers lightning fast, full courses to your pocket so you can learn on the go, offline, and with others. So that is by no means today's reality. Uh, lightning fast is not true. Full courses is close to true. Um, learning on the go is sort of true depending on bandwidth um, options or availability. Um, offline is also partially true and with others it's not true at all really other than the discussion forums. Um, so we have a long way to go to make this statement true um, and so to that end we're working on a number of different projects. Uh, so I'll talk about the sort of things that are in progress and then um, very lightly mention the are not yet started, but that we would love support from the community on. Um, so the first five things that are listed on this page are customer problems that we've been working on, some of them upwards of eight months. Uh, we've doing, been doing different initiatives within each of these. Um, so of the five, mobile push notifications is the one that has the least to report, even though it may have the most impact long-term for us. Um, but we're looking to add some basic support support for push notifications on mobile to help understand what impact it has on retention. Um, and eventually that may help justify sort of a greater investment there. But otherwise not much to report on that one. The second thing to, to note is sort of richer mobile learner analytics and tools. So we really didn't have this two years ago. So we couldn't, we didn't understand how big the channel was, how it was growing, whether what we were doing and building was helping. So we now have a lot more um, in this space. So we use Fabric and are soon to use Firebase Cloud, um, Firebase Cloud, uh, or uh, Fabric Analytics, sorry, um, to sort of see even more data for us on how usage is um, sort of changing over time. We're working on deep linking through a third party service called Branch. So anyone that has a mobile app could enable this service or integration. And what that means is that if you send out a link to your learners, that's a branch link, it'll automatically route them either to the app view or to the web view, depending on sort of um, if they have the app installed or not. Um, so a couple other things on the analytics and tool space, but uh, we expect that'll wrap up in the next month or so. Initial mobile application landing has been something that we've been working on, as you can see in the description here, since version 2.11 or 2.12. So major navigation overhaul was a part of this for the course level as well as for the app level. Um, we've sort of simplified or cleaned up the, the launch images, uh, the launch screen and view, the pre-login view and the mobile apps, um, and sort of visibility to, to programs is not, it's its own thing, but it does have some connection to this as well. Um, 
so like I said, this is another one where it's about a month more. We're, we're targeting Microsoft social auth as another thing we want to add to mobile because the mobile registration and login experience is not on par with the web. So that's another thing we want to do. And we plan to close this whole initiative out after that. Video experience improvements, moving on to the fourth one here, um, was something that we, ba we basically killed all of the old video locker code and redid the way we do video downloads um, and sort of show videos in the application. This was about a year ago. Um, we've added HLS video streaming to mobile to parallel or echo what we already do on the web. Um, the last sort of thing here is, um, oh, sorry. We also added sort of bulk control so you can download the entire course with the toggle switch or an individual section with the toggle switch uh, for videos. Uh, the final thing here is we want to look at um, some video quality settings, um, some additional settings around sort of what uh, size video or quality video you want to be downloading. But we might actually put the video sort of work on hold after this, um, even though we could probably continue to always make improvements to that part of the mobile experience. So the last thing I already mentioned, uh, which is the programs on mobile bit um, and my program views. So the program dashboard that you already see in NX platform will be available on mobile and then program discovery um, is something that we're pushing onto the future. Although program discovery right now is not something we support uh, in native open NX. So it is something that is not um, as accessible for, for the open NX community. But the My Program Views, if you have the program feature enabled on platform, you should be able to access at least that part of it um, in the mobile app with the work we did recently. So that's a summary of, a quick summary of the past on the mobile side, the statement of where we're moving forward. Um, these five initiatives span basically the work from the last year in very high level detail. In fact, I, I missed a bunch of other details here around like tablet support and a bunch of other things. Uh, but if you do care more about those details, you can dive into those or sort of ping us on the mobile Slack channel, uh, which is pretty active with uh, the development team there uh, responding to folks' questions. Um, but the last thing to mention here is sort of where we're headed. So the, the statement above is kind of a, a preview of um, a number of these. So uh, we right now don't have uh, clear progress in any way in the course. So even though we've added a uh, first version of visual progress on the web, we're looking to add that on the mobile views as well. Um, and the last and oldest part of the code in the mobile applications is the my courses view, the one that loads first. Um, so that's something that we know that once progress is in there, we probably will redesign and re-envision to incorporate progress. Um, and we might actually have a chance of doing this overhaul um, with much less baggage and pain than uh, redoing the courses dashboard on the web uh, currently um, would require. Um, so those are the two sort of big ones in terms of uh, progress and how we convey it. There's also a path for us to expand mobile app language support. So there's already some members of the community that are building and rendering the app in Arabic and Hebrew. Uh, we have only distributed the app um, in Spanish and English right now, but we want to sort of expand that. So that's something that's we're kind of chipping away at slowly. Um, there's a number of other features and things that we need to find how to fully translate. So that's part of what uh, part of the work that's been done so far is like the behind the scenes pipeline. Finally, the last two are related. So if you've used the mobile apps before, you'll note that the the slowest part of the application is trying to load any HTML or problem views. And that's because we're actually loading a web view behind the scenes. And we're really not doing a good job of caching or storing the JavaScript or the CSS and loading that just once. We load that every time you go to another activity view or close to every time that you load another activity view. Um, so if we can find a way of sort of solving that problem, uh, we should be able to move to a place where not only are those views much faster to load um, and we could download the requisite JavaScript and CSS um, and sort of keep that on your device uh, for most of the course experience. But we could also move to not just having a single toggle for video download, but a single toggle for the entire course download. Um, so for any of you that use something like Spotify that lets you download everything all at once or any kind of podcast app that lets you subscribe and download the recordings ahead of time, 
it would basically move our applications closer towards that world. Um, once we get uh, this, well, we, we believe that basically with programs and with progress and with this sort of single bulk toggle for the course, that'll move us sufficiently far away enough from version two that we'll bump up to version three um, and we'll see what happens from then on. But cool. that's the update. Excellent. Do you wanna, um, do you wanna talk about your new role and maybe uh, how you're fleshing out Ironwood or, or no? Sure, yeah, Okay. happy to talk about that. Um, so um, let's see, so my, my role is sort of transitioning. I'm still helping cover escalations and helping cover mobile. Um, but increasingly, my time is focused on supporting the internal platform teams and external platform community um, that is OpenEdX, sort of the broader OpenEdX community, um, as a product manager. So more of my time is basically set aside for those, those two functions. So uh, you should see uh, more visibility from us on uh, community pull requests, or what formerly called OSPRs, um, formerly known as, um, and um, our goal with this is to sort of get product involved much earlier in the contribution process, helping to identify when where community interest lies from a product development standpoint and where there's um, sort of interest in getting feedback on product direction. Um, I think thankfully things like the decision architectural decision records, things like OEPS have begun to make a lot of the architectural um, and engineering sort of changes and big uh, platform changes more visible, but it's not always clear kind of where we're headed from a product direction uh, standpoint. So we're hopeful that sort of um, through my involvement and through me involving other product managers that we will be able to sort of get to a point where if say a team wants to contribute some part of the platform that we haven't articulated or documented a medium term vision for on the product that with that group as well as by sort of stimulating conversations internally that we could actually have something that's concrete that we can share with the community for that part of the platform so that'll take time but that's kind of my my new focus um moving forward so um so yeah so cool. that's the All right. update thanks Any questions with any of that that I did like at a mile a minute? Don't forget to unmute. Yeah, either in the chat uh, box or uh, take yourself off mute so we can hear you. Peter. <laughs> Don't mute, sorry. Um, no worries. Uh, okay, so thank you, Marco. Um, Ned, anything you want to add as far as like Ironwood itself or? I don't have yeah. something to add. Okay. All right. Um, it's going to be awesome. <laughs> so I think, I think we're trying to aim for like, uh, what was the question? Baldwin's oh, 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 John Baldwin. <clears throat> yeah. So before we leave Ironwood, um, it is, uh, is Python three going to be, um, on Ironwood? No. Is Ironwood going to be on Python three? No. I, no, there's, there's no way we're going to get that done in time. I think we're aiming for, the new the Ironwood branches to be coming out some December-ish, yes. so hopefully, um, and looking at basically January-ish release for Ironwood. I think it'll be the one after that where that's Python 3, Django 2. Okay, and, just because um, as far as I know, Python 2 end of life is December 2019. Yeah. And that's not very far away, especially when you're looking yeah. at rolling out named releases of OpenEdX. So this is where the Inker uh, projects take a real high priority. Like basically, the sooner we're able to chug through the Inker tickets uh, and get the Python 3 and Django 2 uh, upgrades done and migrations done, the sooner we can get a release uh, around the based on Python 3. Go ahead, and Marco. Also, one thing to flag is also, it's worth noting that I think the other thing that maybe relates to what you said is we're shooting for it looks like a more frequent cadence than than uh, Hawthorne, which was a big yeah because of a bunch of big infrastructure changes was a really long one, but uh, we should still be within I think the 2019. Yeah, I, I think a reasonable target is mid year 2019 having the uh, the Python three upgrade done. Uh, don't quote me on that because we can't. 
this this may contain forward-looking statements, <laughs> and our attorneys have advised us not. Uh, but uh, that that would be, the, I think, the ideal um, once we get Ironwood out. And assuming we can really get the Inker project uh, really off the ground and get more contributions in that area, um, I think the more we can kind of get uh, kind of the, uh, the network effect and, and get those um, closed off, then the, the sooner we can get like a Python 3 based release. But I think the earliest uh, we can get one would be like June of next year. So that's what I'm shooting for. Um, let's let's work together and make it happen. Uh, go team. So, so back on the the Inker uh, topic, um, you mentioned that you know there's going to be a blog on it, and from what I'm hearing from you, that uh, the Inker effort is like absolutely critical to being able to get um, after Ironwood out before um, Python before there's the Python two, and you know because there's only like six months if you're looking at June and, and that. Um, yep is a way to really kind of get the inker thing like in the community's face so to say yeah um, like really kind of showcasing it on the open edX main site and say hey you know developers look here and kind of in you know internally in in the edX team really figure out how to you know uh, uh, you know build community traction on this because it seems that this is really important because being able to get onto Python 3, because I, I, I just, I see that this is a, a big issue. And so we just, we really need to collectively as a larger community figure out, you know, how, how, how we're gonna deal with this so that we don't have a big mess at the end. Absolutely, so I, um, so we did put out a blog post. It is, I think, OLEP 25. Um, there is more we can do as far as like getting the word out, you know, making it more visible on the website, stuff like that. You know, we're certainly open to any suggestions uh, as to make it more visible. Um, I think one thing we can do is just make sure it, it gets the featured treatment on the homepage so that everyone sees it whenever they come to the homepage. Yep. Um, and just, you know, I think there's a lot we can do there on the wiki as well, making sure it's uh, highly visible in the sort of high traffic areas of the wiki. Uh, Ned seems like he wants to say something. He's, he's edging over. Closer, I'm edging closer. over. <laughs> John, I'm wondering what you're going to be doing uh, within your own organization to encourage developers to participate in the Inker process. Well, it's a good question. Right now, um, I guess I need to understand the workflow. I need to work at it myself um, mm -hmm. with that. Yep. And uh, the other thing, you know, that we've got is, you know, we've got customers on Ficus, on Ginkgo. And so we've got to do kind of going through improving um, uh, the automation of our updates, you know, the less manual work and, and risk reduction in getting, you know, upgraded ourselves. So yeah. you know, I'm looking at it kind of from, you know, from that point, um, you know, I'm really kind of starting to for me realize that yeah this is like I, I real this is a really big deal for everybody um and so i'm just really kind of starting to sink uh, my head into it yeah i mean we're all sort of facing the same classic software engineering pressures so any ideas about what works or doesn't work among your engineers would be great to share with other people so we can sort of all start moving forward on it yeah um so there's the anchors and then there's also you know what is the you know, the migration path between versions of open edX mm -hmm. um, and just you know the different ways that we can do you know set up a new server clone database copy the database you know kind of that whole process what can we do um, to like share knowledge to help make that make the make the upgrade smoother transitions um, it sounds like you just added an agenda item for the next configuration. <laughs> <laughs> okay. What sounds like to me I mean, to talk about. I mean, I'm I'm up I'm up for suggestions. I mean, I'm just looking at like for myself, like just kind of working at scripts and figuring out how I can right. you know, do less. Yeah, and definitely, this is one area that we look to the community for guidance because we don't ourselves our DevOps does not face this problem, so our own internal expertise isn't much use to solving it. So the, okay. The, the kinds of role, uh, lagging upgrades that you guys face, either because of time pressure or client reluctance or whatever it is, those are problems that you have the expertise on solving. And the feedback you can give us on 
what we can do to help with that is very, very valuable. Okay, thank you. Got it. Cool. Noted. Awesome. I'm on back. Oh, oh, well, thank you. <laughs> thank you, Ned. <laughs> okay, cool. Um, I think we're, I think that's most of what we had. Let me see if there are other um, updates that we're going to go through. So I look at our handy dandy agenda. I think that's basically it. Are, are there any, um, is there anything that anybody wants to do a show and tell around? Any new stuff that you've been developing that um, you think would be of interest to the larger community? Well, um, if nobody else has anything, um, I mean, I'll defer to somebody else, but if nobody else has anything, I did um, a, uh, a standalone um, dev mode, demo mode for figures. Cool. You want to show it? Sure. Awesome. All right. So let me, uh, let me exit full screen and share my screen. Fantastic. See if I've got, there we go, an empty one here. Oops. Oh, where'd you go? Sorry. Too many desktops. All right. Do I need to stop sharing my screen? Or... No, I will click share. You cannot share your screen while other participant is sharing. Okay, now you should be able to share. Okay, great. Awesome. All right, so there's share there. And let's go uh, window. Here's website. All righty. So um, right now, the kind of the main page is not pretty. <clears throat> um, it's just a landing page in here where I just did the absolute minimum I needed to do to, uh, to log in, log out, um, uh, because figures needs authentication. So basically, the, um, the dev site demo is that I've got a Django site that I had used initially to create the test settings in order to run the unit tests. So what I did is I, modif I created a copy of the, the test settings and modified it in order to be able to run figures. So as far as figures goes, um, it thinks it's running on a real open edX instance. Um, so I'm really what I'm mocking is on the back end. So we click on the, the figures UI. And what we have here is I have um, created synthetic data, uh, basically done synthetic data generation on the open edX uh, model mocks that I had. So in order to be able to show some kind of some interesting things like Looking at here, I generated this a few days ago. And so we click on you know, the monthly active users, the, the metrics cards below, and, and the course cards. I've got two courses. And so we click on see details. And we scroll down, and this shows the differences over the num uh, mo monthly active users for the month, the difference in period. So this is all just synthetically generated. Um, and then down to um, the courses now see the cards, number of uh, registered learners. Um, I just incremented um, up the trend with a number of course enrollments, but it's actually showing, um, you know, this is actually figures, you know, operating as, as it thinks it's operating against a real back end, which was really, really helpful because I uncovered some small bugs in the process of, of doing this. So it was, that part was a really helpful exercise going into uh, the course details. Um, uh, up here, this is, still a, this is still a mock. I'm still, I have in my to-do to work on pulling out uh, a sectional, um, section by section course progress. But the data here in, the, in, um, in these cards is what Figures thinks is real data. Right. Uh, going into, um, and then per learner info where you can click on a learner and see the learner. Um, there's a little issue with the rendering in here that I'll fix at some point, but it's a low priority. So, and then it shows uh, the learner and then the courses that the learner is in. You can jump to a course. So basically the full UI capability select the user. So the full capability UI is here. So I've got this on a branch right now on its own branch. Um, I just kind of hacked this together. Uh, so if we go to branch and then go to dev site demo, and it's in there, and then the instructions are in dev site demo setup. 
which just have very minimal, but it, this is basically the essentials of what you would need of uh, clone uh, the figures repo, uh, change the dev site demo branch, uh, walk through these steps, and then um, you should be able to then run uh, figures uh, in standalone mode without having to have uh, open edX uh, running um, in dev stack. Uh, right now it is Ginkgo um, is what supported. I'm working on Ficus backport and then I'm gonna be working on Hawthorne. Uh, going in, kind of what we've got here um, as far as how it mocks uh, the data is in the tests I had created in mocks uh, the minimum set of uh, models and objects that I needed for the unit tests. And so what I, because it, 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 it helps simplify the tests and it makes the test run a lot faster. I can run all the tests right now in between 9 to 12 seconds. And there's about 130, 150 tests that I'm running. Um, so in the dev site, uh, you basically manage that pie, just a regular Django app. Um, and the settings are in here, are in the settings. So this is also, if you just quickly click on settings, yeah. I'm doing this the same way that you would plug in the end files into um, a, a real edX uh, platform with setting basically adding this in in order to uh, get figures wired in. Uh, if we go into the figures package and go into management and go into commands, we've got, um, no, not that one. Where, were, where was I here? I had generated, sorry, figures. Ah, sorry, I had, didn't put it there. I put it in the dev site. Okay. So in the dev site, there is management command now. And I'm going to do some refactoring on here. I'm going to make this uh, be an app within the dev site uh, just to help make it easier. But basically, what I've got is management command that seeds data. First, I, when I reset it, wipe the data, seed the data. And so go into dev site and then go into seed. And it's really a just hack together code. So it's really, it's a little sloppy right now. But uh, just kind of walk through and uh, see the course overviews. Um, I now have some canned data that I pull through. So I've got two canned courses. I'll, I'll do like a generation of a, like a number and, and randomly generate names. I use, um, um, uh, what did I use? I use Faker uh, to generate data. Um, what I do is I seed users. Um, and then, so I basically, you pick a number Let's go down to the bottom here. <clears throat> um, so the seed all seeds a bunch, bunch of, uh, of data. Uh, so I am, without going into too much detail, I'm, I seed the users. And then I seed the course enrollments uh, for a given course um, after generating the users with the number of users. And then I, um, I need to seed the access roles to show the instructors and uh, course administrators. Um, I see the student module in order to show activity. It's really minimal and it's a mock. So I'm not tying this into any kind of um, a block store uh, for, for, the, uh, the, for, the, for, the, for the X modules. Um, see the course completions generate our fake certificates so we can show course completions. Uh, and then from there, once I've seeded the mock edX data, then I'm basically running, um, running the pipeline to seed the uh, figures metrics for real at this point. And so that's basically it. Okay. So how can we help you with this? What, what, what do you need from the community? Um, right now, I don't really need anything at, at this point. What, um, where I'm just at is taking the, the code that I put here and then cleaning it up <clears throat> putting it into an app within dev site so that it's not in the site code itself and that'll help make it more portable. <clears throat> um, modularize this. This has taught me some lessons um, for how I want to structure the pipeline uh, right. for the code in order to help be able to uh, mock and in inject in fake methods into the pipeline for testing. Um, but right now, I mean, I, I guess as people like download it, try it out, um, and um, just check it out and get familiar, and if things break, let me know if something breaks, something's wrong. 
Um, I plan when I do um, improve this, I'm going to um, allow uh, basically uh, probably with a comp file, um, um, some kind of spec file to say, I want to create a thousand users and a hundred courses or whatever, basically do the numbers. So to scale it up, just to see how it behaves at, at different scales. Okay. Um, so, so this is it. This has been like a learning process for me <clears throat> also in part one on learning about, um, you know, open edX, its models, its backend, how things work. Um, also how to kind of try how to, how to write a reusable plugin. Um, you know, for open edX. And also I'm trying to figure out how I can minimize the amount of mocking that I need to do yeah. um, in order to be able to not have, you know, such, um, um, so, go ahead. Hey John, so, so about writing a reusable open edX plugin, that sounds like a great blog post. <laughs> I would love <laughs> So if you wanted to uh, take a crack at that, I would be, more than happy to publish that on the uh, OpenEx blog. Um, okay. we, we get a lot of requests to be able to correlate um, course activities and learner action. So like, because they always wanna know what's the effectiveness of this video or this section of the course. And so they, they're trying to correlate things they do or change with the actual learner actions. Are, are you planning on that type of granularity in terms of you know, reporting and, and, and I guess your, uh, data visualization? So <clears throat> what I plan on doing, what I need to do with figures is write, um, start writing some uh, architectural um, uh, um, a vision uh, mm -hmm. doc and, 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 base, and, and blog about that or make it, um, make it accessible. And <clears throat> the next step toward get to that goal um, is to allow basically a plug-in metric um, feature into figures so that Base is like, you know, the open close principle is I want people to be able to, you know, we go into I need to and, oh, Excellent. So like what we've got here is we've got these cards and these cards are hard-coded right now And people are going to want to put in their own metrics just as you say It's like I want to see what the video usage is Right, but what we want is we want to be able to have people plug in the video usage because figures always needs to have a baseline of being lightweight you know, your, your site that has, you know, one or two courses, standalone server, be able to, to baseline figures, serve that, and then people can, can add on top of figures by adding plugins on top of figures. Also, as far as pulling in data, um, you know, that requires a lot of processing um, or a large volume of data of, you know, the front end uh, in principle can go talk to some other back end, doesn't have to talk to figures API. Okay. So that if you have a UI plugin that then goes talks to um, uh, some third party source, that would be a great way. Like, let's say you've got data in insights and you want to make an insights plugin and pull from insights and render that in figures. <clears throat> That's part of my vision there. So, but what I really need to do first uh, is, is, um, I, is, is explain how I want, figure out, design um, on paper, what the plugin architecture will look like. Um, communicate that and then start working on initial plugin uh, for assembler for our our Maui for our um, uh, monthly active users got it cool that looks great thanks John Thank um, any questions for John or anything else that uh, anybody wants to bring up for discussion well I could hello yeah hi hi this is Andrew uh, I guess is it if I want to talk about what I'm doing? Is this the right time? This is my first time attending these events. Oh, cool! Yeah, this would be a great time. Um, how long do you think you need? Just five minutes. Is everyone else finished? I think so. Yeah, go for it. Oh, okay. Hi. Uh, thanks for inviting me. Well, um, I've been I I've been working on an API feature called um, course dates. The idea is very simple. For a given course, there'd be an API call that would give you the important course dates and the vast bulk of those course dates are for assignments, midterms and finals. So that's the, I, that's, that's the idea in a nutshell. Okay. You, if, you, if you're in the dev, if you look at the dev um, Slack channel, you'll see me constantly posting. Okay. Okay, and, basically. Uh 
is there anything you want to show or is it, or are there? Well, that- I don't know what, what, what exactly to show outside of a URL. Okay. Because what I did a long time ago was I basically right now I'm, I'm, my approach is twofold. One of them is I'm mocking up the API as a standalone Django app outside of open edX. Just cool. to get the logic right, just to understand the various technologies that OpenEdX is using, like Django RESTful framework, Django right. itself. Because I'm I'm a Python user, but I'm not really a Django user. Right. So that that's the and also you know uh, if I give you a URL, you can you can make you know you could you know you do a get and you you'll get course dates. So that so I can work outside of OpenEdX. My, also, what I'm doing is I'm going through things like the unit tests, which are very, to me, are very good for understanding open edX internals. Okay. But at some point, I have to put the two together. Like this, like last week, I was looking at Django signals to see how the course, I think it's the course date published works to see what sort of information is given. Like this week, I'm looking at celery because I need to run a celery worker workers. So I'm looking at that. I'm probably going to take a week and a half break because I had a talk accepted at PyCon Canada. So I really have to focus on that, but I'm going to move back to this in mid November. Okay. So the things I'm interested in is I'm not quite, there's like simple, like my knowledge is really fuzzy. Uh, there's things like I I don't know how to create access tokens. I've been having pro I've been having problems with 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 O authentication. Um, I don't have like I don't have quite a clear view of how API calls work in Open edX. They seem to be all over the place. You're not the first person to say that. And um, I. And I guess the other thing I eventually have to do again by I want to be in a position by middle of November to actually do a pull request and put my changes in. Okay. Well, I think, uh, well, hopefully you can get the help you need on uh, the dev channel. Uh, and I look forward to seeing your post there and, and hopefully we can get an update uh, next month's, uh, next month's hangout. Um, reminder, I'll, I'll post the, the recording of this uh, hangout. And uh, I'll put the announcement for next month's uh, up shortly afterwards. Well, so. I'll make one. Can I say one other thing about, because uh, I thought I've seen things about Inker in the dev, in the dev channel. Okay. That there was supposed to be a meetup to start doing that. I remember seeing something like that to that effect maybe two months ago. Okay. I would just, um, I would just say, if you want people to work on Python 3, see who's, who's actively developing and invite them. Like I would, I would do Python 3 work if someone just said, Andrew, do some Python 3 work. Okay, Andrew, do some Python 3 work. <laughs> but no, I mean, in all seriousness. Um, yeah, no, I'm we, quite serious we, about that. No, no, no we, we need to, um, we do need to get out the word about the, the Python 3 migration and Inker in, in general. Uh, and so, yes, your, your point is valid. Uh, we need to get more people in the, in the hash dev and elsewhere on the uh, Slack channels to, to get working on that. Look for more uh, announcements around that. And if we need to have like Inker specific uh, hangouts or meetups, we're happy to do that. Just let us know on the dev channel. So yeah, I think- well, I'll, I'll add one last thing about okay. what make I'm doing. Quick, we had to go, but make it quick. Oh. No, I'm just saying, I think you need really more documentation on how to actually add a new API feature into Open edX. Okay. I think that's, yeah, I think there's a lot of work to be done there for sure. Um, okay, so for any topics that you wanna talk about for next week, put them on the agenda. Uh, this is an open agenda, so everyone is welcome to edit, add, or what have you. Uh, and then we'll, uh, we'll, we'll talk about it. Hopefully we'll have some show and tell, more show and tell demos next week. Thank you, John Baldwin, for uh, your demo of figures and looking forward to seeing how that develops over time and looking forward to seeing other stuff too. All right, thank you everybody. Uh, this will go on the YouTube channel and uh, we'll see you next time. Bye. Bye-bye.